I know it's always the, the unenviable position being at the end of a conference, uh, especially on the last day you're standing between everyone and the bar. Um, so I'll, I'll try to uh, keep it as quick as I, as I can. Um, I'll skip who we are um, and just go straight into it. Um, so really wanted to talk today in this session just uh, from our experience advising a lot of companies on how to convert innovation into wealth. I spoke earlier today about IP as the source of wealth creation. And obviously the conference had a very strong focus on IP and therefore I wanted to actually look a little bit about uh, innovation as the source of intellectual property itself. That is, how can we be more innovative and what stops companies from being more innovative? Um, and I want to look at one of the key but what I think is often underappreciated reason why many organisations struggle to actually create intellectual property, which is after all why we're all here, is managing that intellectual property, monetizing it, but why uh, organisations so sometimes struggle to innovate successfully. So I start here with the challenge of growth. All companies must grow. It's an it's a economic and a legal imperative, but sustaining that growth is, is very challenging. Um, there's been numerous studies on this point and basically all have concluded that only about 1 in 10 companies manages to sustain growth over an extended period of time. Uh, you know, Collins, for example, in his uh, seminal book, Good to Great, uh, found that between 1962 and 1998, uh, the Fortune 50 companies, only 13% survived. So you're talking about 87% of those companies actually failing over that period. Um, and the interesting thing is that once growth stalls, it's almost impossible to recover. Uh, only 5% of companies are able to sustain inflation-adjusted growth of more than 6% during their time on the Fortune 50. Um, and of the 95% who stalled, only 4% were able to reignite that growth. So you really don't want to stall if you can possibly do so. Now the pattern of growth failure is actually quite common. Um, management inside large companies know they need to grow. So they tend to invest in new growth generating activities such as acquisitions, R&D, strategic alliances. The growth investment fails, the stock price collapses, the board panics, management are fired, um, new management come in, they kill those costly growth activities. The business returns to what it was always doing which is low growth. Uh, the stock price rebounds. Uh, the company unfortunately however is now encumbered by the legacy of those activities, typically debt and new management back to square one. Um, rinse and repeat essentially. Now there are three common explanations for why growth is quite hard. Um, number one, management doesn't know what it's doing. Um, this isn't true. 90% of companies fail to grow. Not every manager can be incompetent. Number two, managers are too risk averse. This is clearly not true. Uh, there are plenty of examples of senior management out there making billion dollar gambles. Um, so clearly there is an appetite for risk. The third uh, commonly cited explanation is that um, new growth business is simply unpredictable. Uh, it is a, it's a lottery, it's random. Um, now this is not true either because some companies do demonstrate extended periods of innovation and growth. Now, the closest explanation to why inner growth is so challenging is the third one, that growth is unpredictable. But this is still not completely correct. Growth seems unpredictable because the primary driver of growth is innovation. And innovation seems like an unpredictable and random process. In other words, what we have is this. Innovation drives growth and innovation is unpredictable, therefore the conclusion is that growth is unpredictable. Now it is true that innovation, that is IP creation essentially, is partly serendipitous. But innovation and therefore the growth that it produces can become more predictable by understanding how innovation actually occurs. So the reason why innovation seems unpredictable is because the traditional approach that has typically been taken to innovation and therefore to IP creation is the hypothesis I put to you, flawed. So what is this traditional approach? Well, traditionally when we look at innovation and IP creation, there's only been one way to access innovation. That is, typically a company creates it itself. Secondly, there's only been one way typically, and this is changing uh, in the last 10 years, um, but there's only typically been one way to deploy that innovation, that is inside our own products. And then thirdly, IP protection was typically filed for purely for defence. That was no one else is allowed to use our innovation except us. 
There's a great quote from Henry Chesbro, the um, author of Open Innovation, about this. IP is created internally, used internally, and brandished only on occasion to ward off intruders. External innovation is suspect, unreliable, and to be avoided. This approach is driven typically by two um, key drivers. One, fear, that is the loss of our ideas to competitors, and secondly, arrogance, that is we know our business better than anybody else. But the net consequence uh, is that the majority of valuable innovation in IP is actually never used. And um, some statistics here. Um, Siemens estimated quite famously that 90% of all German patents, which are a useful proxy for all corporate IP, were never commercialised. And there was quite a seminal study by Procter & Gamble in 2002 that identified that 92% of its patents had no business value of any kind to Procter & Gamble. Now, as a as an or industry, that should concern us because if we're creating assets and spending money on creating assets that aren't being used, then uh, all things being equal, that means those assets won't continue to be created. Um, so we need to, as I think was mentioned earlier uh, in the video presentation, we need to create higher quality assets and that re requires more and better innovation processes. Now when I put up these statistics, I typically get two responses. There's a knowing chuckle that people think, yeah, that's, that happens in my company as well. We file an awful lot of patents and we have an awful lot of IP we never use. Or alternatively, there's a look of shock because no one's actually ever thought to ask, how much IP do we actually have? Um, is it being used? If so, how is it being used? Uh, are we creating revenue from those IP assets? And if we're not, why not? And what is our actual return on investment in R&D and intellectual property? So that traditional approach to innovation um, and IP creation doesn't work. Now there's lots of different reasons for this. And these include a lot of companies believe that the answer is having lots of ideas. In fact, that the more ideas they have, the more innovative they'll be. Um, but I would contend to you that having too many ideas can actually be worse than having too few. Uh, and there's lots of reasons behind that. Secondly, the commercialization, that is exploitation of intellectual property, is frequently under-resourced relative to R&D, which is IP generation, or the marketing of core products, which is, our existi which is existing IP. So, in short, commercialization is really expensive. It's often under-resourced in a corporate environment. Um, a third factor is that researching the wrong ideas creates major long-term problems because you allocate resources to the wrong areas within the business. And a fourth one, that there are fundamental obstacles to innovation inside the modern corporate structure. Now, unfortunately in 15 minutes, um, 20 minutes, I don't have time to examine all of these factors, but I'm going to spend my time on the, th on the, on, uh, the point D, because I think it's a really critical area, but it's one that often doesn't get discussed, and that is these fundamental obstacles to innovation inside of most corporate structures. So... In large companies, middle management plays an instrumental role in innovation and IP creation process. They select, they promote, and they initially resource new ideas. But I would argue that there are internal pressures within companies which cause management to make what look like apparently rational decisions, but which actually stop innovation or cause them to ignore it altogether. And they break down into four areas. First of all, the incentive system inside these companies is often back to front. Secondly, there's a desire for solid data. Third, most, the most talented managers are rapidly promoted. And fourth, there's a pressure to deliver results fast. And I'm going to look at each one of these quickly. So let's look at the incentive and compensation system. Middle management are instrumental in deciding which ideas to promote to senior management for funding and attention. But they've got a major problem. The incentive system is back to front. If you're a middle manager and you promote an idea that is wildly successful, oftentimes you'll receive little or no direct reward. Um, even in, with stock options, etc., you, uh, you only will receive a sort of a very marginal impact uh, unless the idea is absolutely disruptive and changes the entire company, which oftentimes will lead it to actually being killed, but that's a separate issue. But if you promote an idea that fails, you're often severely punished, so you get loss of career prospects, etc. So in, in essence, many managers are actually in an all-risk and no-reward situation. And therefore, that creates a tendency on their part to promote safe ideas, which are really those that are uh, suitable for high growth. Secondly, the desire for solid data. 
Middle management know that large companies make decisions using evidence and therefore they promote ideas with solid market data and substantial market opportunities. <coughs> Problem is, frequently the highest growth innovations have little available data and the initial market is very small. That's precisely because the innovation is new. So, this creates a tendency to choose safe, very well-known innovations that can be, used to justi can be justified with market data but which are unlikely to generate significant growth. But, of course, those innovations still absorb resources. So it's another major problem is that we're selecting innovations precisely because they have data around them, but those are precisely the innovations that are least likely to generate high growth. The third reason. In a large organisation, it should have a well-functioning uh, HR system, and that HR system will typically aggressively identify and promote talented middle management. The result is the best managers stay in their roles for no more than a few years. A few years is not enough time to understand an area well enough to commercialise something, or tentatively, and the result is they tend to focus on innovations or IP that can pay off in a very short period of time. Again, these tend to be safe innovations that are unlikely to generate the highest growth opportunities. And finally, there's big pressure to deliver results fast. In most corporations, 80% of the revenue comes from just a few products. Most resources are focused on these products. Everything else is a distraction. So what that means is that innovation and new IP projects take a long time to produce, and initially the results they generate are very, very small because the starting markets are small. And so the problem is that when things are good, all the focus is on making money and the focus on those core products. And when things are bad, all the focus is on cutting costs. Either way, innovation projects are a distraction and they're often intact internally. In fact, the biggest challenge most people in innovation face is from internal pressure against them, not external pressure. Unless that environment changes, what you're going to find is middle management will continue to make decisions that retard or ignore the highest potential innovations. Consequently, growth, which is where we started, the legal and economic imperative for all companies, will continue to be elusive. What that means is we need to change the environment. So how do you improve innovation? Well, I've got five minutes to try to sum up a huge topic, but I'll do my best. Innovation, especially disruptive IP, will tend to threaten the status quo and it will initially return very little economic value. Therefore, there needs to be strong and committed manner of support from senior management for innovation. If it's not getting strong support from the top, it's not going to happen. Secondly, secondly, innovation is fundamentally driven by entrepreneurs. Therefore, you need to create an environment that accepts failure and rewards initiative and risk-taking. Third, Recognise that in new growth areas, traditional market data, research and analysis have limited value. There's the famous quote by Henry Ford that if he'd listened to his customers, he would have designed a faster horse. Right. So we need to adopt new market research and IP analysis techniques that are customised to innovation. Fourth, the risk of failure must be balanced against access to rewards. That is, we need to modify HR compensation policy to enable individuals and project teams to substantially profit from the success they create or contribute to. In short, the classical corporate environment and the innovation approach, uh, and therefore the environment, I, I have, are completely different. They have completely different skill sets. We look at what is, what is best suited to the corporate environment, Oft structured, often rigid decision making, an innovation environment, flexible, ad hoc decision making. The classical corporate skill set is about reducing risk. Innovation skill set accepts and works with risk. Corporate environment favours specialists. Innovation favours generalists. Corporate avoid failure. Innovation failure is frequent. Corporate work with reliable, solid data. Innovation often the data is either irrelevant or not even available. Classical corporate skill set, you're targeting large, well-known markets with a quick certain payback. Innovation, initial markets are often small, they're unknown, they're dis the payback's distant and irrelevant. Corporate, you prefer certainty and known facts. Innovation skill set, you're comfortable working with uncertainty. In essence, if you are working within a large organisation and you're trying to promote growth, what that means is that you must actively build an innovation environment in which the skill sets on the right hand side are actively encouraged and built. So in summary, rushing through here, all corporations must grow, but growth is hard, it's risky and it seems difficult to replicate. 
Innovation drives growth. If we fail to innovate, it inevitably leads to organisational collapse. You only need to see Kodak, for example, as a, uh, for an example of that. There are many factors that affect innovation, and I've looked at just one today, which is management. The management environment is key, but it's often an underappreciated factor. I'm not suggesting this is the only factor, but it is a critical factor. Building an innovation skill set is a critical is critical to creating the kind of high value IP that fuels long term growth and stability in companies. So thank you, uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all.